Lecture number eight, meditation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. From our discussion of the Noble Eightfold Path, it can be seen that the core of the Buddha's way to liberation consists in the practice of meditation. It was by meditation that the Buddha reached enlightenment himself, and it is only by meditation that those who follow his teaching can generate in their own mind the wisdom needed to reach enlightenment. There are two main types of meditation taught by the Buddha. One is called the development of serenity, samatha bhavana. The other is called the development of insight, vipassana bhavana. The word translated as meditation is bhavana, which means literally bringing into being, that is, development or cultivation. So the practice of serenity meditation, samatha bhavana, is actually the development of serenity. And the practice of the pasana bhavana, insight meditation, is the development of insight. The development of serenity aims specifically at developing samadhi, that is, a deep, concentrated state of mind in which the mind is unified, freed from discursive thoughts. This state of concentration brings inner serenity, inner calmness. But that state of serenity is not the ultimate value of this type of meditation in the Buddhist path. The real value of samadhi or concentration is to act as a basis for developing wisdom. As we saw in the last talk, the Eightfold Noble Path is divided into three stages, moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. The root of all bondage and suffering is ignorance, lack of understanding things as they really are. The one factor that can cut off ignorance and issue directly in liberation is wisdom, or panya. But for wisdom to arise, the right conditions are needed. Wisdom can't arise in a mind that's scattered, disturbed by many stray thoughts, by distractions and desires. Wisdom can arise only in the concentrated mind, the mind that's been cleansed of all disturbing thoughts, the mind that's been brought to a sharp point of focus, clear and precise. Thus, the practice of serenity meditation, samatha bhavana, aims at developing concentration as a foundation or basis for arousing wisdom the wisdom which can cut off ignorance. The actual development of wisdom takes place through the other form of meditation, the pasana bhavana, insight meditation, the development of insight. Insight meditation aims at seeing, at gaining direct insight into the real nature of things. This insight is the essential key to liberation in the Buddha's path. And this form of meditation is the type which wipes out all the illusions, the delusions, the wrong mental conceptions which are created by ignorance and which keep us in bondage. It's the insight meditation which illuminates phenomena for us just as they are free from all distortions and projections. Now, serenity meditation is common to both Buddhist and non-Buddhist systems of practice. It was practiced in India long before the Buddha even appeared in the world. The states to which serenity meditation leads are the deep absorption, the jhanas or the samadhis. And these are regarded as being very beautiful and lofty states of consciousness, very exalted attainment. However, from the Buddhist perspective, they are not essential to liberation. 
They are of value as providing a base for wisdom, but they are not indispensable. The Buddha mastered these types, these stages of attainment when he was a bodhisattva before his own enlightenment. And though he reached the highest attainments of serenity, he found them inadequate. At best, they can serve as supports for developing wisdom, but in themselves, they are no guarantee for the attainment of wisdom. For Buddhism, the real way to awakening lies in the practice of insight meditation. Insight meditation is the unique discovery of the Buddha, the crest jewel of his path to deliverance. Both serenity meditation and insight meditation are concerned with purifying the mind from defilement, from greed, hatred, and delusion, and the other unwholesome states that arise from them. But the two types of meditation purify the mind in different ways. They clear up the defilements at different levels, and they're directed also to principally to different types of defilements. To see how the two types differ, we have to understand that the defilements have a stratified structure. They fall into three layers. They operate at three levels. And they have to be dealt with in different ways at these different levels. The subtlest layer of the defilement is called the layer of latent tendencies, the anusayas. At this level, the defilements simply lie dormant at the base of the mind. They don't appear in active form as volatile forces at work in the mind. They just lie quietly below the surface of consciousness. But when we encounter experiences that strike us as either agreeable or disagreeable, or when we evaluate things and relate them to ourselves, then the defilements can be aroused from this condition of latency. They can wake up and rise to the next level where they appear in active form. This active form of defilements is called the stage of manifestation, pariyutana. At this second level, the defilement becomes a formative influence on the thought process. It motivates our thoughts, our attitudes, and our emotions. Then, if the defilement gains still more power, if it reaches a point where we can no longer control it, then it reaches the third level where it spills out in the form of some unwholesome action, some unwholesome deed of body or speech. This third level is called the stage of transgression, Viti Kama. To give an example, we might be walking down the street, very calm and very happy. There's no trace at all of anger in our mind. Then suddenly we might meet somebody who displeases us, so we had some past quarrels with. When we see him, just when we get the impression of his face and body, then there might arise some impression of anger. And so the defilement of anger now comes to the surface. We become angry. As we get closer to him, we can no longer control our mind. So we burst out in some angry outburst. We speak to him in a nasty and offensive way. In this occurrence, we could see all three levels of the defilements at work. When we're walking down the street, very calm and happy, there's no anger at all present in the mind. But anger is still dormant in the consciousness as an anusia, a latent tendency. When we get the impression of that antagonistic person, and then when we become angry in mind, then the latent tendency tendency has risen up to the surface. Anger has reached the level of manifestation. Then when we can no longer control the anger and we break out in harsh speech, 
then the anger is moved from the level of manifestation to the level of transgression. It's m motivated and unwholesome verbal deed. Now, the three steps of the Buddha's path are designed to counteract the defilements at these three different levels. The first step, sila, moral discipline, prevents the defilements from reaching the stage of transgression. When we take the precepts, we put a check on our actions of body and speech to ensure that they don't fall into the grip of the defilements. So they don't become a means of expressing greed, hatred, delusion, or their offshoot. But even when we're following the precepts carefully, the mind can still be overrun by the defilements occurring in a purely mental form, operating at the stage of manifestation, governing our thoughts, our emotions, and attitudes. To overcome the defilements at this level, we have to develop concentration, samadhi. When the mind becomes focused and concentrated in a wholesome way, then the active form of the defilements is checked. The defilements subside from the surface of the mind, pushed out by the force, the pure concentration. However, even though the defilements do not appear, still they will remain below at the level of latency as potentialities able to spring up again in the future if they meet suitable conditions. Therefore, the work of concentration is not enough. It's not sufficient. What is necessary is to eliminate the defilements entirely right down to the roots, right down to the level of latency. This is the work of wisdom, panya, developed by the practice of insight meditation. When insight is developed, when it reaches its highest point, then it issues in the wisdom of enlightenment. And this wisdom of enlightenment cuts off the defilement right at their source the bottom of the mind. Thus the difference between serenity meditation and insight meditation can be understood in terms of the way they purify the mind. Serenity meditation purifies the mind from the defilements in their active form. It removes them from the level of manifestation. And it does this by suppressing the defilements. And here we have to say that the word suppression in Pali Vikambana shouldn't be confused with repression. Repression is an unconscious mechanism by which the thoughts and emotions are pushed out of awareness, usually with fear and aversion, and they still continue to operate below the surface in subliminal form. But suppression is a conscious process a process by which we mindfully still the activity of the unwholesome state. We deliberately remove them from the surface with full awareness of what is taking place. And so in serenity meditation, we suppress the defilement, we remove them from the surface of the consciousness. But in contrast, Insight meditation aims at purifying the mind by removing the latent tendencies. And it does this by cutting them off at the level of the root by means of wisdom. Also, there's a difference between the types of defilements with which the two kinds of meditation are principally concerned. Serenity meditation is concerned principally with removing the course of defilement, such as greed, hatred, and certain of the coarser, deluded states. In contrast, insight meditation is directed principally to the subtlest defilement, 
that is to ignorance. It's intended to remove even the subtlest and finest rootlets of ignorance. Now, there are two basic approaches to the systematic development of meditation. In both of these, the essential place belongs to the practice of insight meditation. The two approaches differ in the way they utilize concentration as the basis for insight. One approach is called the vehicle of serenity, samatayana. In this, in this approach, we develop serenity to a very deep level, to a level of deep concentration until the mind enters samadhi on a single object. Then by means of that concentration, we stabilize the mind on that object. We make the mind firm and steady and clear away the active form of the defilement. Then after developing this concentration, we use that concentration as a basis and turn the mind to develop insight. Then we go through the levels of insight meditation. So that is the approach called the vehicle of serenity. The other approach is called the pasanayana, the vehicle of insight or the method of dry insight. In this method, we do not aim to develop a deep concentration by fixing the mind on a single object. Instead, we start off directly with the practice of mindfulness, with the four foundations of mindfulness, contemplating the changing processes of the body, feelings, states of mind, and mind objects. But as we cultivate mindfulness, as we go on contemplating the changing process, we also develop an accompanying kind of concentration. This concentration doesn't reach the full depth and stillness of the concentration developed in the other approach, in the vehicle of serenity. This is a fluid, mobile kind of concentration which runs alongside the development of insight. It's called momentary concentration. But it's not called this because it lasts only for one moment and then disappears, but rather because it flows along from moment to moment in the changing process of awareness. As it is cultivated moment by moment, it picks up momentum until it becomes strong enough to keep the defilements away and to allow insight wisdom to arise. Which approach is chosen between these two, that depends partly on the personal temperament of the meditator, partly on his circumstances. Some people feel the need to cultivate a strong level of concentration first. Others feel capable of going directly into insight practice. Also, sometimes we might need a teacher who emphasizes one method sometimes a teacher who uses the other method. And then to take advantage of that teacher, we have to follow the method that he teaches. Now we'll explain both forms of meditation briefly and then give some practical instructions. First, however, we should say a few words about the preliminaries to meditation. Buddhist meditation is a practice which belongs to the Buddhist tradition. It arises out of the Buddhist understanding of the nature of human existence and it's directed to the goal made known by the Buddha, the attainment of Nibbana. Therefore, when meditation is taken up in the traditional context, practice begins with the act called going for refuge. Going for refuge means entrusting oneself to the guiding ideals of the Buddhist path. There are three guiding ideals, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the enlightened one. 
the supreme person who by his own unaided effort discovered the way to deliverance. The Dhamma is the truth of liberation, the path that leads to the attainment of liberation and the teaching that gives instructions about the path. The Sangha here is not the order of monks, as the term is usually understood, but it's the Aryan Sangha, that is, the community of noble disciples of the Buddha, those who have followed the path to the high levels of attainment and reached one of the stages of enlightenment. These three, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, are called the three refuges because they make possible complete deliverance from all of the dangers and sufferings of existence. The Buddha is compared to a wise physician who diagnoses our condition and prescribes a remedy. The Dhamma is like the medicine that he gives, and the Sangha is like the attendants who help us to get well. The most important of the three is the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the medicine, the actual refuge. The act of entrusting oneself to these three, relying on them for guidance, is going for refuge. And the practice of meditation properly begins with the attitude of taking refuge. This is expressed through the standard formula in Pali, Buddhang Saranang Gachami, Dhamang Saranang Gachami, Sangang Saranang Gachami, Dudiyam Pi Buddhang Saranang Gachami, Dudiyam Pi Dhamang Saranang Gachami, Dudiyam Pi Sangang Saranang Gachami, Tatiyam pi budang saranang gachami, Tatiyam pi damang saranang gachami, Tatiyam pi sangang saranang gachami. I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Dhamma, I go for refuge to the Sangha. A second time I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. A third time I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. The next preliminary after going for refuge is taking the precepts, pledging to observe morally pure conduct. Moral discipline Sila is needed primarily to hold in check the coarser expressions of the defilement, to prevent the defilements from motivating unethical action of body and speech. When we practice meditation, we're trying to purify the mind. And in order to clear the mind of the defilement, it's necessary to prevent the defilement from breaking out into unwholesome acts of body and speech. If we give way to the, to the defilement and act with them as our motive, this will only involve us in a crossfire of aim. On the one hand, in meditation, we're aiming to purify the mind of the defilement. On the other hand, in our daily conduct, we're living under the sway of the defilement. And if we get caught in this crossfire, this will just frustrate our attempts to gain calm and insight, and it will destroy our efforts at concentration. So therefore, before undertaking the practice of meditation, we have to make the firm resolution to observe the five precepts, the basic framework of moral discipline. That is, first, to abstain from taking life, from destroying life. Second, to abstain from taking what is not given, from stealing. 
Third, to abstain from unwholesome forms of sexual misconduct. That is, for lay people, from adultery, seduction, forced relations, uh, promiscuous, meaningless relations, and so on. Fourth, to abstain from false speech or lying. And fifth, to abstain from taking intoxicants, liquors, drugs, and so on, which cause unclarity of mind. Sometimes during periods of intensive retreat, intensive meditation practice, lay meditators take up temporarily a more austere ethical code. This includes observing celibacy, brahmacharya, for the period of the retreat. Not eating after midday, but is taking the main mid meal before midday and not eating any solids after that. Avoiding entertainments and personal adornments and avoiding sleeping on a high bed, instead sleeping on, on the floor, on a sleeping bag, on a mattress on the floor. These activities themselves are not immoral, but to indulge in them causes distractions of the mind which disrupt the work of meditation and drain energy that can be used more profitably to develop the mind during that precious period of the meditation retreat. And therefore, to strengthen their practice, lay meditators frequently observe these additional precepts. Okay, now we can discuss first the development of samadhi, concentration, by means of the practice of serenity meditation. Serenity meditation, as we said, aims specifically at developing concentration or samadhi. Concentration is defined as the wholesome unification of the mind. Kusalasa chitase kagata. It's the collecting of the mind upon a single object focusing of the mind upon a single object. And one who sets out to develop concentration first selects a single object to be his primary meditation subject. The word meditation subject in Pali is kamatana, which means field of work. That's the field where he's doing his spiritual work, the meditation subject. In the text, mention a variety of possible objects. Later tradition enumerates these as 40. We don't have to explain all 40 of them. But they include, for example, what are called the casinas, that is, circular discs that represent the primary elements, earth, water, fire and air, or discs, colored discs, representing the primary colors. Also among the meditation subjects are the parts of the body, the three refuge objects, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, the meditation on the in and out breathing, the divine abodes of loving kindness, compassion, and so on. Altogether, 40 subjects. Out of these, the meditator will choose a single object, or if he has a teacher, his teacher will assign him a single object. And then when he begins his work, the meditator will try to focus his mind upon the single object, excluding all sensory impressions, all discursive thoughts, all the other countless mental distractions. Whatever arises, whatever comes up, He just lets it go and brings the mind back again and again to his basic meditation object. For example, if he's meditating on the breathing, then he'll bring the mind back to the touch sensation of the breath as it moves in and out. Whatever thoughts come up, he just notes them briefly and lets them go, bringing the mind back over and over to the same focal point the touch sensation of the breath. Now, as meditation progresses, various impediments can come up. When they come up, they obstruct his efforts 
They prevent him from reaching deep concentration. The Buddha has gained a thorough familiarity with these impediments, and he's classified them into a set called the five hindrances of Panchanivarana. The five hindrances are sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and worry, and doubt. The first hindrance is sensual desire. Sensual desire is the yearning and craving for the objects of the senses, for agreeable and delightful sight, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, as well as for the thoughts and images based on these. When these kinds of thoughts come up, then the hindrance of sensual desire has arisen. The second hindrance, ill will, includes all negative mental states. Hatred, aversion, anger, hostility, discontent, depression, and so on. Sometimes ill will might be directed to people, sometimes to things, sometimes to situation. It takes many forms. The third hindrance is the compound dullness and drowsiness. Dullness is mental inertia, rigidity and stiffness of mind, drowsiness, sleepiness, lethargy, indolence, and so on. These two are combined as dullness and drowsiness. The fourth hindrance is restlessness and worry. Restlessness is the excited and agitated state of mind. Worry is the nagging sense of remorse and regret over things that we've done mistakenly in the past, over problems lurking ahead in the future. Then the fifth hindrance is doubt. This doesn't mean questions about the doctrine and discipline, but rather it's a kind of persistent uncertainty about the Buddha and his teaching, the inability to make up one's mind to follow the path, the inability to accept the Buddha as one's teacher, the Dhamma as one's teaching, the inability to commit oneself to the practice. These five hindrances, when they come up in the mind, prevent the deepening of calm and concentration. Therefore, the Buddha calls them hindrances. And in a very interesting simile, the Buddha compares each of these five hindrances to a particular impurity of water which prevents a person from seeing his reflection. If a person wants to see his reflection in a pool of water, the water has to be clear without any impurities. Now, sense desire is like water having many different colored paints on its surface. Sense pleasures seem beautiful and attractive, like brightly colored dyes. But if the surface of the water is colored with beautiful colored paint, you can see your reflection, just as you can gain concentration or insight if the mind is obsessed by sense desires. Ill will, that is like boiling water, water with bubbles rushing up to the surface and breaking moment by moment. If you try to see your reflection in boiling water, you won't succeed. Similarly, when the mind is boiling over with hatred, with anger and ill will, then you can gain calm and concentration. Then sloth and torpor are like water that's overgrown with moss. The moss is the symbol of stagnation, of sliminess. And the moss prevents you from seeing your own reflection. And so sloth and torpor or dullness and drowsiness indicate a stagnant state of mind, a mind which is inert and rigid and can't move, can't allow calm and insight. Restlessness and worry, these are like the surface of water that's been churned up by strong winds break it into waves and ripples. When restlessness and worry pass through the mind, then they disturb the thought process. They cause many rippling thoughts that prevent calm and insight. Then doubt, 
Doubt is like muddy water, water which is completely unclear, unable to give back a reflection. For concentration to be attained, the five hindrances have to be eliminated. And to eliminate them, the Buddha recommends a variety of methods. The first technique to be employed is simply to make a note of the hindrance when it arises, then to let it go without becoming disturbed by it, without feeding it with too much concern. If we follow the hindrance and latch onto it, then of course the hindrance will just grow and become stronger. But also if we become upset by it, if we become repelled by it and try it to push it away, then also the hindrance will gain in strength and become persistent. But if we just make the mental note of the hindrance and bring the mind back to the object, then it's likely that the hindrance will lose its momentum and will just subside. But if the hindrance still continues to crop up, another method that can be used is to focus attention on the hindrance itself, to observe it with mindfulness. Since the calm and clarity of mindfulness are incompatible with the mental disturbances, this method shuts out the hindrance and often succeeds in making it subside. Then when the hindrance subsides, the meditator can return to his primary object. But if the hindrance still comes up, If it proves to be really persistent, then we might have to drop the primary subject and take up a special measure directly opposed to the hindrance. Thus, the Buddha has given methods to counteract each of the five hindrances. But when sense desire arises and becomes persistent, then a helpful method is to meditate on the impermanence of the sense object to see it as going uh, as something that's bound to be destroyed, that we're bound to be separated from it, and therefore it's no point becoming attached to it. Sometimes if other bodies become the source of sensual attachment, then we can just reflect briefly on the impure or unattractive nature of the body. See, the body is a heap of bones encompassed by a bag of skin filled with blood and with many organs and muscles and so on. When we reflect in that way, very often the hindrance of sense desire subsides. The antidote to ill will and aversion is to develop loving kindness towards other people, metta bhavana. This we will explain in greater detail later. And with regard to situations, to develop patience in the face of those situations simply to accept them as the working out of our karma. The antidote to dullness and drowsiness, the Buddha has given several methods to deal with them. One is to develop a perception of light, to meditate on a bright light. Another method is to practice walking meditation, to get up and walk back and forth vigorously, and that will sometimes stimulate the mind. Sometimes even washing the face or going out into the cold air is helpful. Any of these methods can help to spell dullness and drowsiness. To get rid of restlessness and worry, a helpful method is to practice mindfulness of breathing, to narrow down the attention and focus on a single, very simple object, which will calm down the restless waves of thought. Also, it's very helpful to eliminate worry and mental disturbance is meditating on the figure of the Buddha, seeing the sublime, peaceful, serene figure of the Buddha. Then, to get rid of doubt, sometimes to get rid of doubt, we have to lay aside our meditation and interrogate, to ask questions, to study. Sometimes also devotional practices are helpful. And also what's sometimes needed is just a strong resolution to commit oneself to the practice and to stay with it without continually surrendering to all of the questions that come up, to all the suspicions and uncertainties, but just to stick with the method and to suspend the doubt, to see how things work out as we progress with the practice.
Now, as the meditator continues with his practice of serenity meditation, continues developing concentration, he arouses in his mind five mental factors which are repeatedly strengthened and reinforced by his efforts. These mental factors are called the five factors of absorption, the five jhana factors. They are initial application, sustained application, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. Initial application, vitaka, is the mental factor of applying the mind to the object. It is said to have the function of lifting the mind up and directing it to the object. It makes the mind strike again and again at the object. The second factor, sustained application, is the continuation of that. It's the factor of continued pressure on the object. This factor keeps the mind occupied with the object examining it, applying the mind again and again to the object, keeping the mind anchored on the object. The difference between initial application and sustained application is illustrated in the text in this way. Initial application is like the striking of a bell. Sustained application is like the reverberation of the bell. Or initial application is like a bird striking its wings to go up into the air. Sustained application is like the bird continuing in flight. Initial application is gross. Sustained application is subtle. Initial application brings the mind to the object. Sustained application fixes the mind on the object. Then the third factor is rapture of PT. This is pleasurable interest in the object, interest which can range all the way from a momentary thrill of delight with the practice of meditation, all the way up to overwhelming ecstasy, where the body and mind are flooded with rapture, with ecstasy. Then the fourth factor of absorption is happiness or bliss. Sukha. Happiness is the pleasant feeling that accompanies the practice. It's something that's somewhat different from rapture. Happiness is a feeling, whereas rapture is a full state of mind. And happiness begins as a new kind of pleasure, pleasure which is purer and more peaceful than sense pleasure. And then as it's developed, it rises up to the height of bliss. The very pure, tranquil bliss. Pleasure which is purer and more peaceful than sense pleasure. And then as it's developed, it rises up to the height of bliss. The very pure, tranquil bliss. Then the fifth jhana factor is one-pointedness of mind. That is concentration. The focusing of the mind on the object without distraction. Now, these five jhana factors, as they are nurtured through the work of concentration, they counteract the five hindrances. The five jhana factors and the five hindrances are aligned with each other in a one-to-one relationship so that each jhana factor opposes and shuts out one hindrance. Thus, one-pointedness of mind counteracts sensual desire. Rapture overcomes ill will. Initial application shuts out dullness and drowsiness. Happiness or bliss overcomes restlessness and worry. And sustained application puts away doubt. So as these five factors emerge in the mind, they bring about a gradual purification of the mind from the hindrances. And when the five hindrances are fully suppressed, fully excluded, then the mind enters into a state called access concentration, upachara samadhi. 
The word upachara means suburb. So the mind in this state is now in the suburb or neighborhood of concentration. It's approaching the royal city of deep samadhi. The hindrances have been conquered, vanquished, but concentration is not yet fully matured. The texts compare access concentration to a baby or a child that's beginning to walk. He gets up, he walks a few steps, and then he falls down again. But the meditator continues with his practice continues to fix the mind on the object, striking at it again and again. As he does so, the jhana factors become stronger and stronger until when they reach full maturity, they plunge the mind into the object with the force of absorption. This is called upana samadhi, absorption concentration, full concentration that the mind becomes fixed upon the object without any wavering, without any vacillation or shaking. Now the mind is like a man who can get up from his seat and walk as long as he wants without falling down. The first level of full absorption is called the first jhana. The word jhana has no real adequate equivalent in English. We can call it absorption, but it's just as well to keep the Pali word jhana. There are four jhanas, each one deeper and subtler than the other. The first, they're called just that, and they're called just by their numerical sequence. The first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth jhana. Each of the four jhanas is defined or constituted by a certain set of factors, which are the jhana factors. The first jhana has five factors, the five already mentioned, initial application, sustained application, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. In the second jhana, initial application and sustained application are eliminated. And so there are three factors, rapture, happiness, and one-pointed, and one-pointedness. In the third jhana, rapture is eliminated. And so there's two factors, happiness and one-pointedness. Then in the fourth jhana, happiness or pleasant feeling subsides and it's replaced by a different kind of feeling. It's called equanimous feeling or the feeling of equanimity. So that jhana has two factors the neutral feeling or the feeling of equanimity, and again, one-pointedness of mind. Now, after attaining the first jhana, the meditator doesn't proceed right right away to the next stage. First, he has to repeatedly enter the first jhana. He has to become thoroughly familiar with it, skillful in attaining it, and gain mastery over it. He perfects his attainment of the first jhana until he can enter it whenever he wants, remain as long as he wants, and emerge from it without difficulty. Now, when he masters the first jhana, he then begins to see that there are certain defects with this jhana. It's not completely subtle, not fully peaceful. It's still a little coarse and rough because it's disturbed by initial application and sustained application. And then the meditator aspires to reach a deeper level of absorption, the second jhana. So he makes an effort to develop stronger concentration. And when his faculties mature, then he enters the second jhana. He repeats the same thing. He masters the second jhana. Then he sees that it has a defect, that it contains rapture, which is a relatively coarse factor. And he knows of the state beyond this, the third jhana, which is more peaceful and sublime. So he undertakes the practice for that when his faculties mature. Then he enters the third jhana. Again, he masters it. He sees that it's defective and that it contains happiness or pleasant feeling, which is a coarse feeling compared to pure equanimity. And so he undertakes the practice for the deeper level of absorption, the fourth jhana. And when he reaches the fourth jhana, then he attains that state which has equanimity 
and one-pointedness of mind. In the fourth jhana, the mind becomes completely still and silent, very, very still and pure. But beyond the fourth jhana, there are still four more levels of samadhi that can be achieved. These are called the immaterial or formless attainments. Their names are the attainment of the sphere of infinite space, the attainment of the sphere of infinite consciousness, the attainment of the sphere of nothingness, and the attainment of the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. These are very profound levels of samadhi, of concentration. And the last of these, the attainment of neither perception nor non-perception, this is the very pinnacle in the unification of consciousness. At this point, the, the mind becomes so still, so concentrated, that it's impossible even to say whether perception is present or not. This is the peak in the development of concentration. Now, in all these states of samadhi, the four jhanas and the four formless attainments, the defilements are completely suppressed. However, the defilements are not eliminated. They're still present at the bottom of the mind in the form of latent tendencies. They're still lying dormant. And the reason that they're still lying dormant is because the fundamental root of all defilements is still present. This fundamental root is ignorance, the darkness of ignorance which covers over the true nature of phenomena. Therefore, in order to get free from the latent tendencies, one has to eliminate their support. One has to eliminate ignorance. And there is only one thing that can eliminate ignorance. It's direct opposite, panya or wisdom, the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Therefore, after passing through the stages of jhana, the yogi has to emerge from absorption. But now that he's entered and passed through the jhanas, his mind has become very clear and pure, bright and luminous, very soft and malleable. So having emerged from jhana, his faculties are fit and proper for developing vipassana, for practicing insight meditation. That is the procedure for one following the vehicle of serenity, to develop deep samadhi first to any level, either access, concentration, or to one of the jhanas, then go on to develop the pasana. One who follows the vehicle of insight, or the dry insight method, goes directly into contemplating the factors of mind and body without developing deep samadhi. But whatever approach he follows, the vehicle of serenity or the vehicle of insight. To develop insight, the yogi has to cultivate the four foundations of mindfulness. The mindful contemplation of the body, of the feelings, of states of mind, and of dhammas, the mind factors and mind objects. As he practices the four foundations of mindfulness, the field of experience becomes immediately accessible to him in very fine, detailed, microscopic focus. The aim of developing wisdom is to understand the actual nature of experience, to understand the nature of experience as it unfolds at the successive moments of experience. In the text, wisdom is defined as the knowledge which penetrates the true nature of dhammas, the true nature of phenomena. And it has the function of dispelling the darkness of ignorance which covers up the true nature of things. The phenomena which have to be known and, and penetrated, these are the states that constitute our own experience. Therefore, the attention of the meditator in the practice of insight meditation 
His attention has to be bent back upon his own experience. He has to turn his attention back upon the experience in order to understand the fundamental nature of the experiential process. At the first level, the meditator has to see his experience in terms of its constituting elements. This is the analytical side to the cultivation of wisdom, to see the experience as a compounded process made up of many components. The root form of ignorance is the idea of a self the false identification of oneself as a subsistent ego entity. And what causes this illusion to arise is the tendency to grasp things as solid wholes, to see them as monolithic unities, rather than to see the complex nature of things, to see the interwoven, intertwining nature of things. To correct this error, this illusion, the experience has to be broken down into its components. And that means to break it down into the five aggregates. When we look at the experience just as it is, we see many elements fused together, functioning in unison. First, there's the material form, the body, the sense organs, the sense objects. Then there are the feelings, the perceptions, the volitions and consciousness, the mental side to the process. So the yogi, the meditator, learns to see each occasion of experience as occurring from the integral functioning of the five aggregates. Then the yogi puts the aggregate of material form on one side as materiality. On the other side, he puts the four mental aggregates, which he classifies as mentality. And so he then sees the experience as occurring through the unified flow of these two streams of events, the stream of mental events, or the stream of material events, and the stream of mental events. He sees them as constituted entirely by these two streams, without any self underlying them, without any permanent subject supporting and upholding them. Then he sees that these two streams of events are just conditionally arisen phenomena. They have no being in themselves, no power of independent existence, but they occur in dependence on specific conditions and cannot occur in the absence of those conditions. It is at the next stage that the practice of vipassana actually begins. Vipassana is to see the true nature of phenomena, and this means to see the five aggregates in terms of the universal, all-pervading characteristics, the three characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta, that is, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. And so the meditator investigates each of the aggregates in turn, learning to discover the three characteristics. He looks at the material form of the body. He sees that all bodily states are impermanent in the sense that they are subject to destruction. They arise, subsist momentarily, and pass away. He applies the same to the four mental aggregates, the feelings, perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness are all impermanent. They arise, break up, and pass away. Then all the five aggregates are dukkha, subject to unsatisfactoriness, in the sense that they can't provide any permanent basis for security. They are unreliable, subject to the afflictions of aging and death. And again, they are all selfless, without any ego, without any intrinsic core of substance, just momentary happenings, without any self at their base. So 
So having examined his experience in terms of the three characteristics, to sharpen his insight, the meditator begins contemplating the rise and fall of these phenomena. He watches the material form of the body, the states of feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness arise and fall away, arise and fall away. And as he contemplates the rise and fall, the three characteristics become clearer, more evident, more pronounced. Then to deepen his insight, the yogi drops his attention to the arising phase and focus ex- focuses exclusively on the last stage in the process, the stage of breaking up of dissolution. When he does so, he sees that all the formations of existence are subject to destruction. They all break up and dissolve immediately after they arise. This insight into dissolution leads to the realization that no security can be found in conditioned existence. Nothing in the world can be relied on. Nothing can be held to for protection and shelter. As he sees the insecurity of all the things in the world, then his insight into the unsatisfactory nature of existence matures. His mind begins to turn away from all the things in the world. Now there arises a strong desire for emancipation, and that desire leads to a deepening of the power of insight. The mind penetrates to deeper levels of understanding until it reaches a stage of profound equanimity where the yogi looks upon all conditioned states as impermanent suffering and without a self, but he has no fear, no disgust, no sorrow. He has complete equanimity as he's watching the process. This stage marks the highest level in the development of insight. What lies beyond this is the stage of the supermundane paths and fruits. As the meditator goes on contemplating, when his mental faculties become fully mature, a sudden radical change takes place. Suddenly, the meditator realizes that the supermundane path is about to arise. The supermundane path is a state of consciousness, a chitta, with the special function of realizing nibbana and eradicating defilement. There are four supermundane paths, successive states of such consciousness. These come in distinct stages with the time interval between them. Each one realizes Nibbana for a single moment and eradicates certain defilement right down to the level of latent tendency. The first path to arise is called the path of stream entry. It's the first stage in the realization of Nibbana. So after the meditator reaches the peak of insight, his mind turns away from all the formations of existence and attains the path of stream entry. And for this brief moment, it penetrates the unconditioned element, Nibbana. It leaves behind all conditioned states and directly perceives, directly realizes the deathless state, the deathless state. And simultaneously with the realization of Nibbana, three defilements get cut off right down to the level of the latent tendency. The defilements that keep being bound to samsara are called fetters, sangyojana. They're called fetters because they keep being chained to the wheel of birth and death. There are ten such fetters which are eradicated in different stages by the four paths. The first path, the path of stream entry, eradicates the first three fetters. That is the fetter of personality view, the view of a truly existing self which can be identified with the five aggregates. The second fetter is doubt, perplexity. And the third is clinging to rules and rituals. 
And as soon as the mind enters the path of stream entry and sees Nibbana, these three fetters are all broken simultaneously at once. Now, the moment of the path is immediately followed by a few moments of another type of consciousness, which also experiences Nibbana. This type of consciousness is called fruition. Each path has its corresponding fruition coming immediately after itself, and the fruit has the same name as the path. Thus, the first fruition is called the fruit of stream entry. It's a sequence of a few moments of consciousness which experience or enjoy the results of the path. They experience the bliss and peace of Nibbana right after the defilements have been eradicated by the path. We can understand the relation of the path and the fruit in this way. The Suppose there's a man who's bound by chains. Suddenly he exerts all of his energy and he breaks the chains. The moment of breaking the chains, this is like the moment of the path when the fetters are eradicated. But as soon as he breaks the chains, he feels great relief, joy and happiness, the sense of freedom. This moment of happiness, or these moments of happiness, that is like the moments of fruition that follow the path. Now, after passing through the path of stream entry, the yogi becomes a stream enterer. He becomes an Aryan, a noble person. He's risen up to a whole new level of being. He's entered the stream of the Dhamma. He's not yet fully liberated, but he's bound for full liberation. He's irreversible. He can never fall away from the goal of reaching full enlightenment and liberation. At the maximum, he will reach final Nibbana in seven lives which will be spent in the human world or in the heavenly world. He can no longer take rebirth in the four states of misery, in the hells among the animals as, a, as an afflicted spirit or as a titan. His spiritual progress will continue from life to life. And now we're going to cover all the levels of attainment. And so after reaching the stage of stream entry, the yogi wants to progress further to reach the next stage of liberation. He again undertakes the cultivation of insight. He passes through the different levels of insight. When he reaches the highest point, when his faculties mature, he attains the second path called the path of the once returner. Now this path does not actually eradicate any fetters completely, but it weakens two fetters, the fetter of sense desire and the fetter of ill will. Then the yogi experiences the corresponding fruition and comes back to normal consciousness as a once returner. This means he will only come back at a maximum of one more time to the human world. Wishing to go further, he again develops insight. He reaches the highest level of insight and attains the third path the path of the non-returner. This path eradicates the two fetters that were previously weakened, the fetter of sensual desire and the fetter of ill will. The yogi passes through the fruit, through the fruit and he emerges a non-returner, an anagami. This means he will never again return to the human world or to any heavenly world in the sense sphere. If he doesn't reach full deliverance in this life, you will take rebirth in a special heavenly plane called the pure abode, and there he will reach final deliverance. But now the yogi wants to reach the final goal in this life, and so he begins to develop insight. He goes up the ladder of insight realization, and at the peak he reaches the fourth path, the path of arhatship. With this path, he eradicates the five remaining fetters. That is, the desire for existence in the realms of fine material forms and in the immaterial forms of the six and seven fetters. He eradicates conceit, which here means not the coarse conceit of pride, but the subtle conceit of an existing eye. Then he cuts off restlessness, 
the fundamental agitation present in every mind that's not fully enlightened. And at last he eradicates ignorance, the most basic fetter. Following the path he experiences, the fruit of our hardship, and then he emerges as an arhant, an accomplished one, someone who's completed his training and lives in the experience of Nibbana. As an arhant, he's no more tied to the round of becoming, but he abides in peace through the rest of his days, and with his passing away, he attains the final goal, the Nibbana element, without residue remaining. And that is the consummation, the end of the path. Now we will conclude this talk with some practical instructions on meditation. Probably the most fundamental method of meditation taught in the Buddhist tradition is anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing. This method is often taught to beginners but it can also lead to all of the higher stages of the path, both in serenity and insight. It can even lead up to full enlightenment. In fact, it was the mindfulness of breathing meditation that was used by the Buddha on the night of his enlightenment. We can begin our explanation by saying some words about the right sitting position. Throughout the Buddhist tradition, Meditation is practiced generally in the cross-legged posture, sitting on the floor. And even though this might cause some pain and discomfort at the beginning, it's advisable for those who are physically capable of it to try to use this method. It will probably get, take some time to get accustomed to it, but it will be worth the effort since it will be most valuable in the long run. It gives a firmness and stability that's difficult to achieve when sitting in a chair. And to give some support to the body, to the bottom especially, it's good to use a cushion, a cushion that's not too soft and about three or four inches high. If you don't have a cushion, then you can use a set of folded blankets. You might also put a soft rug or blanket underneath the knees to prevent the knees from getting pain during the course of sitting. And when sitting on the floor, it's not necessary to take the full lotus posture. In fact, this should be avoided except by those who are already able to sit in that position for long periods. It's better to learn to sit in a fairly comfortable position than to sit in excruciating pain from the start. So instead of the full lotus, you could sit in the half lotus position, that is, with one foot resting on the opposite thigh, or else you could take the quarter lotus position where you have one lower leg lying on top of the other. And if that's too difficult to manage, you can try the lion posture where you have the two lower legs lying alongside each other on the ground. The legs do not cross at all. But if you can't manage with any of these positions, then you can sit on a straight back chair sitting straight up with the feet on the ground. Whatever position is used, it's most important to hold the upper part of the body erect. The back should be straight, but without strain or tension. If the body is too slack, then drowsiness will come. But if it's too rigid, that will result in agitation and tension. Here, the best way is the middle way, erect yet relaxed, not too tight, not too loose. Then the head should be upright, veering neither to the left nor to the right, but the head can be tilted just a wee bit forward. The eyes can be closed or half closed, whichever feels most comfortable. The hand should be placed on the lap, the right hand on top of the left, the thumbs touching. The mouth should be closed and all breathing should take place through the nose. Then once we can sit in the correct physical posture, we have to know how to deal with the mind. The untrained mind, the mind that's not disciplined in meditation, generally flits from thought to thought, very often without any control or reason. 
just roaming and wandering restlessly. To develop the mind for calm and insight, we have to learn to focus the mind, to train it to remain on its object. And the object we use in the meditation on breathing is the breath itself, the in and out movement of the breathing. We breathe mindfully, aware of the movement of the breath, observing the normal flow of breath. And the breathing done in this meditation should be done entirely naturally. There should be no effort to interfere with the movement of the breath to control it, to hold it in, or to breathe forcefully. Just breathe at the normal rate and observe the movement of the breath with mindfulness. And to train the mind, we have to have a place to fix the mind. And the place where we fix the attention is the area around the nostrils or on the upper lip, wherever one feels the touch sensation of the air coming in and going out. The actual object of attention is that touch sensation, the sensation of the breath coming in and going out. You shouldn't follow the breath into the lungs. You shouldn't follow it out into the air. But just keep the mind posted at the door of the nostrils, mindfully aware of the touch sensation, in and out in and out. The mind should be like a sent sentinel keeping watch at the door of the nostrils. Just remains there checking the visitors, the visiting breath coming in, the visiting breath going out without moving into the body or out into space. And to help keep the mind on the breath, it's helpful to make a mental note when breathing in, make the mental note in, in, when breathing out, make the mental note, out, out. And one should keep the awareness constant through all phases of each movement. With the in-breath, from the beginning of the in-breath, through the middle, down to the end. Then from the beginning of the out-breath, through the middle, to the end. For the in-breath, make the mental note, in in for the out breath make the mental note out out some teachers recommend counting the breaths for each inhalation and exhalation one two three and so on up to ten but most uh, practitioners or many practitioners have found that this method gets confusing and so we advise just using the mental notes of in and out in and out but the attention itself should be on the breath sensation, not on the mental notes. We just use the mental notes to keep the mind on the sensation. There's an alternative way of doing this meditation introduced in Burma in recent, year, in recent years. This is to make the object of attention the rising and falling movement of the abdomen rather than the touch sensation of the breath. As we breathe in, you notice the abdomen rises. When you breathe out, you notice the abdomen falls. And so we follow this rising and falling movement of the abdomen that accompanies the in and out breathing. This movement is grosser than the touch sensation of the breath, and therefore many people find it easier to follow. In following the rising movement, we make the mental note rising, rising, when following the falling movement, to make the mental note falling, falling. And try to follow the entire movement, the rising from beginning to end, the falling from beginning to end. And pay attention to the actual bodily sensation of rising and falling, not to any mental images of them or to the mental notes. You can try both methods at first the touch sensation and the rising and falling of the abdomen, then you could try to find out which one is easiest to follow. Try them both and then choose one. But once you choose one of these methods, then you should follow it through to the end. You shouldn't go switching back and forth from one to another. That only leads to confusion. 
But having chosen one, just make the resolution to stay with it. Now, whichever one, whichever method you choose, certain obstacles are bound to arise. We might mention some of these. The most obvious obstacle is the wandering of the mind. Very easily the mind tends to stray to other thoughts, thoughts about the past, about the future, about the present, about work, pleasure, friends, enemies, and so on. Whatever stray thoughts arise, you just note them. Wandering thoughts, wandering thoughts then let them go and bring the mind back to the object, to the touch sensation of the breath or to the rising and falling movement of the abdomen. Don't comment on the thoughts. Don't become disturbed by them. Don't hang on to them. Don't get carried away by them. And don't try to force them to go away. Just make the mental note, wandering mind, wandering mind, stray thoughts, stray thoughts, then let them go by themselves and bring the mind back gently but firmly to the subject. The same applies if you hear sounds, sounds from the outside, traffic, voices, and so on. Just don't become disturbed by the sounds or discouraged by them. Just make the mental note, hearing, hearing, then let go of the sounds and bring the mind back to the subject. Also, sometimes mental images will arise, pictorial images, memories, imaginations. Just make the mental notes, seeing, seeing, let go of the mental images, bring the mind back to the subject. The touch sensation of the breathing, rise and fall of the abdomen. Another problem that can arise are painful sensations in the body especially at the outset, pains in the legs or in the back. When pains arise, then one shouldn't start shifting the body or moving about, but just make the mental note, pain, pain, or sensation, sensation, then let the pain go, let it continue on its way, but you bring the mind back to the primary subject, the breath or to the rising and falling. Also, if itching takes place, don't start moving to scratch the itch. Just note the itching sensation, itching, itching. Then let it go its own way and bring the mind back to the subject. But when pain arises in the legs, if the pain gets too strong will it, when it really interferes seriously with your concentration, then you can just mindfully readjust the posture to a more comfortable one and then go back to the primary subject. The meditation on breathing can be extended either into the level of deep serenity or else it can be made a foundation for the practice of vipassana or insight meditation, depending on the mode. But here we don't have to describe these advanced details. At the outset, it's just important to develop this fundamental mindfulness, observing the in and out movement of the breath or the rising and falling of the abdomen. There are many other subjects of meditation, but time only allows us to mention this one method here as a foundation for practice.